Leia Healthcare. It's good to live. Proud sponsor of the Real Health Podcast with Carl Henry. Hello, welcome to Real Health with me, Carl Henry, in association with Leia Healthcare. On this week's show, I want to talk about the relationship between image and confidence and how everyone can work to feel more self-assured in the workplace and in life. My guest for this week's show is Laura Jordan of SolidSavvy.ie. Laura, welcome to Real Health. How's life been over the course of the lockdown? It was, it's been a complete change. I mean, this time last year, I was panicking like I have never panicked before work-wise. Obviously, we were all scared and didn't know what was happening. My whole life turned upside down in the space of a few weeks, as did most people's. Um, but for work, for me, I've spent five years building my business. I work night and day at it. And my job is, for want of a better word, to touch people, you know, in terms of clothes, wardrobes, all that stuff. And also uh, we do a huge amount of seminars and events and that all needed to stop. We had to cancel events. I remember, I'll never forget it, 12th of March, Leo Varadkar, one o'clock made it announced that we had a sold out event that evening in house on Leeson Street to cancel the whole thing. And we had many others around the country that was a domino effect from there. But I had to learn to be okay sitting at a desk to move everything online which we have done um obviously I miss the in-person connection I miss the shops I miss the buzz I miss the people because my my the favorite part that I I suppose the engagement I get from my job is working with people hearing their stories particularly strangers I think that's what we're missing at the moment is talking with strangers and I love helping people um, and that's been more removed at a distance at the moment with the online platform grateful for you to do it we took about two three weeks to get everything online and we're like right how can we make this look just as attractive as an online offering uh, as it is an in-person one and we've taken it from there but there is no way of disguising the fact that it, it, the job satisfaction is not the same as it is for me being out and about I always joke when I graft the streets of my office you know and um, that's where I love to be and in a big group of people talking at an event is one of my favorite things to do. So it has been it has been a challenge. But on the plus side, I've learned that I don't need to drive all around the country, that I am able to, you know, walking is actually good for you. Uh, it turns out fresh air works. I uh, didn't really realize that one either. Um, and I've learned to take care of myself a bit better because I've had the time to and I've needed to for my own head. And I don't think I ever did that before. I just kept running from one thing to the next, going at 90 miles an hour. And it's fair to say, like, you know, you've got a great passion for what you do. You can see that. And, you know, a lot of it, I suppose, is based around the, the first impressions for people. And it is really important especially more so now on Zoom. So even if you're having a Zoom meeting or a Zoom interview or whatever it may be, that first impression and that Zoom imagery is crucial, both in terms of clothes and in terms of backdrops and stuff like that as well. Massive. And I think even, you know, to the starting point is that the energy you need on a video call is more than you need in person. It's like when you're doing TV, you know, that yourself, you have to smile much stronger and wider than you would in real reality. You kind of feel a bit silly doing it nearly. But it's that idea of having to give more in a digital sense than you do in person. And that is the, the starting point. Without question, the issue of well, what do I wear for a Zoom interview? I am at home, but should I look like I'm at home? You know, and it totally depends on the wider issue of workspaces we're talking about now. Many have changed their dress codes to suit the fact that we're at home. So I will be dealing with solicitors and accountants and people with very high powered, responsible jobs who are wearing leggings and, and hoodies at home and saying, this is fantastic. We've shown <laughs> that we can do the same amount. We, you know, our brain works the same, which it does. Um, and, you know, we're comfortable. We're working in an environment where we're not having to wear full tailoring head to toe. And then we go to the opposite of that, which is people who say, I get huge confidence from what I wear. And the interview setting obviously requires you to put your best foot forward. That's what we want to do. But I always say, think you know, in terms of what you can see around you, a bit of, we all are nosy, right? So we'll all look and see what's in the background. We'll have a little look. So you don't want it, you know, plain uh, backdrop is maybe a little bit unnerving. So show a bit of context. Um, you can use the you know, the automated ones if you like, but I feel you almost need a green screen behind you for them to work effectively. I think Teams works better than Zoom for that, just whatever way the two um that the two platforms are set up in terms of appearance and how you put forward like you're basically looking from your you know your chest up or your waist up at a push and um, earrings lipstick a little bit of print they are things that add vibrancy and energy and if you are interviewing with a group of other people or there's a you know a number of candidates in in, in line for a job you you know it is that idea and, and it goes against what I say almost all of the time which is you should be hired based on what you say not based on what you look you wear my job is to make sure that what you wear doesn't stop you in your quest 
to be hired by what you say. Um, but in this sense, a little bit of extra, a little bit of, of color, a little bit of energy is helpful to be memorable because you don't have your in-person presence to pull that off and to add into the mix when you are interviewing at the moment. Okay, and it is important, like I suppose on a professional level, my professional image is a t-shirt. It's very relaxed. I have a pair of shorts on and I have demo exercises behind me and stuff like that. But it is important to put a little bit of time aside and look at your professional image and identify what that is. Uh, because if we are working from home over the course of the future in terms of that blended approach, that professional image, whether you're in the office or at home, is going to be really important. Definitely. And I think the idea of dress for your day had been introduced by many companies over the last number of years. And I've worked with, with it many in terms of implementing those dress codes. And now we're going to see that come to the fore for every single organization. It has been proven, number one, that you do not need to be in an office space to work effectively. And number two, that you need, do not need to dress or wear a certain type of garment in order to work effectively or be taken seriously. That said, most people are going to jump at the chance to go into an office and wear tailored clothing and exciting outfits again but we do need to have that approach to our outfits so I'm having to edit my advice which I always gave previously which was all your work wear together in the wardrobe all of your weekend or casual wear now I'm saying right we need that approach for what are you doing today where are you working that does cause more considerations and more time and takes up more headspace. So we have to watch that because my job is to create uniforms for my clients and most of them are very busy and don't have time to think. So my job is to do the thinking for them so they can open in their wardrobe, pull out anything and it's wearable or in fact, follow the guidance I give them over. You know, we have photo albums on phones that we use and different ways and means of making life easy. So we want to think, right, I want to make capsule concepts of if I'm at home, this is what I wear. If I'm having a meeting with someone I need to impress, this is what I wear. If I get an absolute treat of going into the office, this is what I wear. But I do think the outcome of COVID, one of which is flexible working and, you know, in and out and two days in, three days off, etc., is going to be the idea of having complete change to our concept of dress code because we've seen and we've, I've read so many articles on like will the, the, the power dress the killer heel the suit will the suit come back and yes I think we're going to want it to because we want that change from our casual item and I do think that that idea of creating a persona in terms of the role you're comfortable in and, and the one you want is really important so for example it is the expectation that you will wear workout gear when you are speaking or, you know, presenting. It would be strange if you wore a suit. It goes completely against your business model and what you do. Whereas if I was presenting in front of a group or even if I came on, you know, any call, which is visual and I was wearing a track suit and it would be odd my content will be the exact same. I would say the same stuff, but I always equate it to being the and rather than the but. So I want people to say, yeah, Laura seemed like she knew what she was talking about and she did, rather than, yeah, I really, I wasn't sure next to her, but she was quite, you know, some of what she said was, was quite helpful. So you all, I think that that's one thing to take away from this conversation is you want to be the and, tee yourself up to succeed, people expect it from you. And then you roll with that. Like, I want to be stopped in a law firm by someone to ask, am I a solicitor? Where, where am I going? You know, because I should have that image when I'm in there. Similarly, if I'm in a tech firm, what I'm wearing, it should lend itself to that environment. But it, I can't, the best will in the world, I am unable to turn up at an event wearing a pair of ripped jeans or a leggings and, a, and a, 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 you know, and a pair of runners because it doesn't fit with the image that I need to give across. I could, but I just have to work harder. I don't want to have to work harder. So I try and make smart decisions by putting the image out there that allows me to not have to prove myself non-verbally and subconsciously. I'm not saying any of this is ever deliberate. No one wants to feel they're being judged when they walk into a workplace or an interview. But there is that thing of helping yourself. I say, give yourself a good head start. The one thing you can control is the way you present yourself. You can't control communication. You can't control attitude. You can't control work ethic. This is the one thing that's on you and in your control for yourself. What about if there's a massive difference between that persona, that professional persona that you're trying to create and your actual persona? So for example, for me, I wear this kind of get up all day, uh, pretty much. If I put on a pair of jeans, I get dressed up. And I actually use clothes as a way to, if I've had a really busy day, to separate work life 
balance. I'll go upstairs, I'll put a pair of jeans on and I'll come down and I feel kind of dressed up and out of work mode. But for some people, there's a huge difference between that professional persona and reality. What tips have you got for them? I think that is a crucial balance at the moment because for most of us, our workplace is our home and I advise a lot of clients right now to change out of whatever they feel comfortable in wearing for work and whatever their workplace you know requires of them whether that be in your case you're going from casual to more smart for other people it'll be vice versa and I say some people to some people there's nothing wrong with creating an image and an armor but it must be you so uh, the query arises all the time to say I work in a corporate law firm my dress code is business professional. I must have a collar or a cut shoulder and a tailored skirt or trouser. But my personal style is difficult to portray. And that's what makes me feel me. I say, right, this is where we look at using our accessories. I want to see bright beads. I want to see interesting, you know, an interesting bright shoe or lipstick, whatever that might be. And for the lads, I say, let's go a bit more unusual with the tie or with the neckerchief or the cuff link, whatever it is, to give that bit of personality while still adhering to the dress code. And and for want of a better word, you know, having that image that's expected of you when you walk in the door. And I think what we've noticed, particularly in Dublin, is you know, tech firms have disrupted this, which is fantastic in many ways. And we have, you know, people saying, well, if I work in the law department for Google or Facebook, like I want to wear jeans and a hoodie and I will. And then you have law firms saying, it doesn't matter that you're working with these other customers, you're, you, you are wearing a suit. That is why you're here. So you've got to look at your, how do you let your own style shine through? Because that's what makes you feel you. And that's what helps your confidence. That's what we're talking about. The idea of the image and confidence link. We want to still feel that you can be you within the slight restrictions of our workplace and I always equate it to like when you're in school and you can't say to your your school principal look I'd love to wear this uniform but it's just not me or I'd love to wear you know this color this I'm sorry it's not going to work for me we don't you know children learn that from the age of five um, and we we are expected to comply and that's the difference between image and style image is extrinsic it's what we need to wear to suit the environment in which we find ourselves whether that be a gym or a boardroom where style is intrinsic it's what's inside ourselves and it's what we wear when we can wear whatever we want when there's no calls on our time when we when we're with our friends or we're at home and those two things are sometimes confused and they those words are used interchangeably but there's a big difference between them and if you can get opportunities to let both of those exist whether it be at different times of the day or week or even within the one situation that's really helpful for your self you know I suppose certainty or your understanding of your own personality one of the words you mentioned there was colors are there, is there any way for people listening in to know that cert, a certain color or color palette works for them in terms of the clothes they should buy depending on maybe their hair color or their eye color or is there a way of, of, of knowing that or is it bringing the professional and let the professional look at it or a trial and error what's the best way to find out there, there is the very helpful way of getting a start. And then I suppose I should say, or my accountant will tell me to say <laughs> that you need to bring in a professional. But first thing to look at is to decide whether you have a warm or cool undertone to your skin. And the way you do that is you take your wrist and you look at the veins, which are close to the surface of your wrist, and you check if they're mostly blue or mostly green. If they're mostly blue, you have a cooler undertone to your skin. If they're mostly green, you have a warmer. People who have a cooler undertone to their skin typically see colors that have a base of blue. So blues, purples, certain greens, certain pastels, certain neons. And we can, like there's a full color palette that we explore and work with on that. If you have a base of green, it's likely of the warmer undertone. All of the colors that work for you have a base of yellow or orange. And that's our difference. Now, if I'm going to be incredibly stereotypical about it, a person who has blue eyes and blonde hair will be in likely in the cooler category. Um, oh, similarly, what I call the snow white complexion. So if you've got quite pale skin and you might try and wear fake tan and say, gosh, it just never looks right on me. But you have, you know, quite, I'd say, husky blue eyes and dark, dark, dark hair. Very common in the Celtic complexion. That's in the cooler category. Whereas a warmer complexion, you may either have darker eyes, darker hair, take a tan, or you may have freckles and red hair like I have. And it puts me in, into the warmer category, even though there's elements of my you know I'm mixed and most of us in Ireland are mixed because we have so many different elements the freckles warm us up 
the blue eyes cool us down. So we do have to check for that. But the first starting point is check your, your veins, check your wrist and see, right, what is the base of colour? And we are rarely wrong. I always say when I look in people's wardrobes and I've been in hundreds of them, if not thousands at this point, and I look and I see what colours people have chosen, we typically know in our gut what's going to work for us and people say gosh that's my favorite dress I can see why the color really suits you so we sometimes know something works and that links in as well with our idea of confidence that if you have a color that you know makes you feel empowered confident expressive that's a huge tool that we need to use we take every tool we can get at the moment in terms of of optimizing our performance and that is something to consider as well the color that makes you feel good what about if you don't like shopping then? So you've looked at your wrists, you've looked at your colour palette, you've a rough gist of what you like and what you hate. And even if it's, on, it's online shopping now, obviously, and it probably will be for the next little while. What if you really, like, personally, I hate shopping. I just don't, I just, I, no, no, no. Uh, no. <laughs> Not that so, uh, hey, Unless it's runners, actually, I love shopping for runners. But generally, uh, are there are any tips in terms of if you don't like shopping, is there a way of uh, making a more enjoyable experience of finding the, the stuff that really works for you? Totally. Yeah, I think the first thing, and I say this to everybody, and, and ironically, my friends and some clients who know me quite well would say, Laura, you're like the shopping police. You take all the fun out of shopping. <laughs> so ironically, for people who don't like shopping, I'm kind of an ideal person to give advice for because it's very clinical. First thing you do, you never, ever spend money in the shops without spending time in your wardrobe. So that's the first place you go. You look and see, right, what do I need to keep, store, mend, throw? What's coming out of here and why? What is left? How do I look at my gaps and how do I make my list from that point? So making a list of the items I need and then I'm going to satisfy that list. So it's very, very focused. I'm not going to go browsing on a, a clothes website where there is thousands of product. And I always say we must divide. And at the moment, clothes are in our phones. They have come into our social media. You can't really avoid them. If you're browsing on a Zara or ASOS website, it will end up in your ads the next day when you are engaging with other channels. So before we had to step into a shop to engage with retail experience, that was very much a decision. Now it's come into our lives, into our phones, into our homes. So that can be good for some people because it's distraction and it's like a form of entertainment. It's like reading a magazine or looking on the Daily Mail or a showbiz website, whatever it might be. Whereas for others, it's a case of, OK, I need to be focused. And how do I do that? And it is looking at the list and saying, if I buy A, B and C, it will match X, Y and Z. And I'm going to search for that item specifically in this website. And that's where I can find what I need. For example, ASOS is a store that's been used extensively by women and men throughout Europe, predominantly in Ireland and the UK. There are competitors in Europe, Zalando, which is bigger and hasn't got the market share that, that ASOS has here. And so many people say to me, I can't work it. It's too hard. There's tens of thousands of items. They say, well, don't ever go into that website without knowing what you want in some sense. Narrow by size, narrow by color, narrow by product. And it, it works for you when you have an, a, a, some sort of knowledge. In the same way, if you walk into a shop and you go for a stroll, you don't know what you want or need. I say this constantly. My friends do not like me for it. I say, well, what are you going to buy? Oh, Laura, I don't know. I'll know when I see it, which is equivalent for please back off and leave me alone. And I just want to shop. I just want the retail experience. That is fine. And I love that as much as anybody else. But I tell myself, I know I'm browsing. If I see something I'd like to purchase, I'll take a photo of it. I might go have a coffee or might sure I'm in shops usually four days a week anyway. So I'll pick it up at another stage. But the, just a little bit of thinking time is helpful. And that way of shopping and, you know, you hit the nail on the head there for people who don't like shopping. There are many reasons and factors why we don't. But my problem is that I don't like seeing people losing confidence with the retail experience because it just gets worse. It's really hard to fix it. And eventually people will come to me and say, Laura, either A, I don't have time to shop. B, I don't know what suits me. Or C, I hate shopping and I don't feel I am good at it. I don't understand how to do it effectively. I'm wasting money. I buy things, the tags are on the, them still. And I don't feel I can, I've got it. I'm not good at it. And the confidence piece there is showing people how to shop for themselves and saying, right, this is how you do it. This is what suits you. This is what you need. Off you go and get it. And being really prescriptive about it at each point. No more than with exercise. I mean, if you, if I went to you and, and you said, right, I, I would just, and this is my problem, I'll just start deciding to run and I don't make any prep or plan and I head off and then I'm exhausted and I pull all my muscles and I don't go back and do it again. So that's the, my attitude to exercise isn't planned and prepped. If I want to succeed, I need to say, right, how far am I going? Have I got water? What's my route? 
etc. I mean, that's making it sound very at a very basic level, but the prep and the planning needs to be similar to what we would do for exercise. It sets us up to succeed then. And presumably then the prep and the plan uh, extends to, to like I would do with a client in terms of their kitchen or their house, you know, setting yourself up for success. The, this version of that is a wardrobe. So auditing your wardrobe, take us through that. So the wardrobe order, I always say, is been negated by the pretty pictures we see on Pinterest and thanks to the IKEA catalogue, which is the bane of my <laughs> professional life because I'm saying, right, yes, it looks pretty. All your coats are together, your jackets, your, your shirts, your trousers, etc. But they're not functional. The, the last thing we need to do at seven in the morning is to style ourselves. Nobody has time for that. And I include myself in, the, in that and it's my job. You need to have sections of your wardrobe for function. So if I'm working, what am I wearing? There's going, it's going to look really messy because I'm going to have my coats, my blazers, my shirts, my, uh, um, you know, t-shirts, if I'm wearing them under those things, my pencil skirts, my tape, tailor shirts, and then my jeans. And I'll, then I wear things I wear um, off or the weekend. And then I might have my evening bits and then I might have my exercise gear. Now, that feeds into the idea of capsule wardrobe in that all of the items that are worn for a similar function all are stored together in so if it's a Wednesday at 7 a.m., I know I'm working from home and I know I've got meetings, so I need to look a bit glam on the top half anyway. So I go and pick my top, you know, my top from there. If it's 7 p.m. on a Wednesday, well, at the moment, obviously, it's leggings and a jumper. And Or if it's on a Saturday, I say, right, what part of my wardrobe am I going to based upon the function of clothes that I need? Because this is what I find with clients. They say, yeah, I have all these things in my wardrobe, but it's a bit overwhelming at seven in the morning. I'm trying to get the kids out to school. I've got to try and get organized for, for work. And I, I'm trying to put together outfits. Nobody has time for that. So to have them pre-organized, pre-styled, even you know, laid out, a lot of people would try and have a little section of their wardrobe or the back of their door where they put their outfits for a few days. That again is that idea of giving yourself a bit more headspace and taking all the decisions out and for clients I work with who are very busy and previously were traveling a lot, I would say to them, look, you've half an hour between finishing meetings and going for dinner. I'd rather you spend that half an hour talking to your kids, talk, you know, or a friend or reading a book than panicking over what to wear to a business dinner that evening. So I want to take that stress out of the equation for you and have that all decided for you before you go. So decision making can be difficult, particularly at the minute, but generally in terms of time. So let's set up the wardrobe so that the decisions are made on a weekend and a time when you are more relaxed and you can put a bit of effort into it and then it's pretty much wears itself and I always say the, the the test of a good wardrobe is that you can send your toddler into that wardrobe and they can pull anything out of it and you're happy to wear it or you can blindfold your husband and say in you go fine or maybe not even blindfold they pick up something that I'm going to wear to work today and you are happy to wear whatever that is and you're not saying oh my gosh that doesn't fit me I hate that that looks awful should have thrown that out or you know this doesn't suit the occasion so that's the test can you send another human into your wardrobe to find something for you and be happy that whatever they choose you'll feel comfortable to wear I absolutely fail that test. My wardrobe's a mess. There's stuff, there's stuff, and actually my organized life, but my wardrobe's a total mess. Uh, okay, final question is this, and I love to ask experts these kind of questions because I'm intrigued by it. And also my role here is to pick up tips and kind of tricks and, uh, from experts in their field. The most common mistakes people make, what do you see all the time with people that you work with and people that you deal with? Are there, there's generally two or three common things uh, people make. I'm dying to hear what yours are. Yeah, first of all, it is buying something because of the price of it, uh, usually when it's on sale. Sale shopping is great and I love it and I'm more than the best person. I love a bargain. But the key question here is you have to ask yourself, would I love to have owned this at the higher price, but I couldn't justify it or afford it? Or am I buying it because it's cheaper? And if you're buying it because it's cheaper, you're more proud of the price tag than of the item. You're just not going to wear it. And that's a, a fact. The second issue I find is that people don't buy clothes for the life they have. And we're all sometimes guilty of that. You want to buy the item that is a little bit frivolous, a little bit ridiculous. And then you realize that the shoes hurt, the dress is uncomfortable, and I actually don't have anywhere to wear a fur jacket. So then you again are not prioritizing your spend effectively. And that comes back to I suppose, the last point here, which is cost per wear. Cost per wear is the basis of all the work that I do with all my clients and even at seminars and webinars. I say to people, the cost per wear of anything is the cost price of it divided by the number of times you can wear it in a three or six month period. It means that the fun things to buy are not the fun things 
longer term. So we get very distracted and I hold my hands up and say, say, do as I say, don't, don't uh, do as I do in terms of an eye catching print or pattern, a pair of shoes and really unfunctional item that we also and sometimes that we just need that. And that's fine. But ask yourself, right, what the buzz mightn't be when I buy it, but the buzz will be when my black jeans or my black boots or my winter coat is there for me every morning when I'm getting ready. And it's those troopers in the wardrobe that need the investment as opposed to the stars of the show, which take our money. They take it. And that's what we spend our money on in normal times, wedding outfits, occasion items, instead of what we really need. And I say in the same sense for people who exercise every day, please spend money on your gym gear because you're wearing it every day. So many clients say to me, I walk every morning and I say, what do you wear? Oh my gosh, if I bumped into a neighbor or someone I knew I would die. It's a, you know, an old Dulux t-shirt and a pair length. And I'm like, well, let's spend money on that then because you put your money where you put your time and that's cost per wear. And that is the best way to succeed at creating a wardrobe that's functional and you get the most out of it. And then you become confident in how you spend your money on your clothes. And that really helps every part of the way your image and style is portrayed. Amazing. Brilliant tips. Simple and effective and absolutely uh, bulletproof, which is great. Laura, remind us where people can find you on Instagram and your website and stuff. They can find me at, at stylesavvy underscore IE on Instagram or at stylesavvy.ie. There's the website where we've all of our personal and corporate services listed there. Amazing. Laura Jordan, thank you so much for joining us on Real Health. Folks, I really hope you enjoyed today's episode, a different aspect of health, but one that is really, really, really important. As ever, we'll be back next week with another episode. If you liked what you heard, please rate and review and subscribe for further episodes when they pop up. Have an amazing week. Work on your wardrobe, get that audit done, and we'll see you next week for more Real Health. It's long a full. Leia Healthcare. It's good to live. Proud sponsor of the Real Health Podcast with Carl Henry.